Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the State Department. Uh, a few things at the top, and then I'll get to your questions. Uh, first of all, um, a few words on the earthquake uh, that hit uh, northern Sumatra in Indonesia earlier today. Uh, we offer our deepest condolences to the families who lost their loved ones, as well as to the communities who were affected by this uh, uh, terrible tragedy. Uh, while we're still gathering information, we do remain in close contact with the U.S. mission in Indonesia to monitor the situation. Uh, we're not currently aware of any U.S. citizen casualties. Uh, the U.S. mission uh, is working to verify the welfare and whereabouts of all U.S. citizens registered uh, in the area at the time of the earthquake. And we stand ready, of course, to provide any and all possible consular assistance uh, should any of them be affected. Uh, we also, uh, this is uh, a good point to, to uh, remind folks uh, when U.S. citizens are traveling abroad uh, to register with the Smart Traveler Enrollment Program at travel.state.gov. Uh, turning to Yemen, uh, we are disappointed by the Republic of Yemen government's reaction uh, to the U.N. drafted roadmap. Uh, as we've stated, the roadmap is not and was never intended to be a final peace agreement. Uh, however, it does offer a solid framework for the government's goal of ending the conflict and returning security and stability to Yemen, uh, a goal that should be supported by all. Uh, it is important that all parties accept the roadmap as a basis for negotiations and that they move to negotiations uh, immediately to secure a comprehensive peace agreement that ends the conflict and allows uh, desperately needed humanitarian assistance to reach all Yemenis. And we call on the Yemeni government to accept the roadmap. Uh, we recognize that the roadmap does contain difficult choices uh, and underscore that compromises and concessions by all parties will be necessary to reach a durable political settlement. As you know, Secretary, Secretary Kerry has been and does remain very much invested and engaged uh, in, uh, in efforts to reach a comprehensive settlement, a political solution rather, under the UN auspices and to establish a durable cessation of hostilities that de-escalates and ultimately ends the conflict there. A uh, couple more things quickly. I just wanted to note uh, that earlier today, some Ambassador Sam Power and Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, Tom Malinowski, uh, announced the launch of the Global Anti-Corruption Consortium on the margins of the 2016 Open Government Partnership Global Summit in Paris, France. Uh, this initiative uh, will advance a global cross-border uh, approach to combating corruption and will accelerate this and uh, scale the impact of civil society-led uh, interventions by bringing together investigative journalists to excel in uncovering corruption with the advocates who package and com communicate information in ways essential to combat and deter corruption. Uh, the GACC will be an important mechanism for exposing and combating corruption uh, around the world and will elevate the role of civil society in this vital work. Uh, the GACC will be led by major international civil society organizations, uh, including the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project and Transparency International. And finally, uh, just uh, a quick update on the Secretary's travel. Uh, <clears throat> Secretary Kerry attended uh, the second day of the NATO Foreign Ministerial Session, uh, uh, which focused earlier today, for, focused on uh, Ukraine earlier today in Brussels. Uh, where NATO uh, ministers, uh, foreign ministers, reaffirmed uh, NATO's support for Ukraine and its efforts to counter uh, Russian aggression, as well as implement Minsk and pursue Kiev's uh, reform agenda. The Secretary also met uh, with Ukraine's Foreign Minister Pavlo Klimkin, uh, underscoring the United States' uh, continuing support for Ukraine and expressed concern about recent increase in violence in eastern Ukraine due to ongoing Russian separatist attacks. Secretary and Foreign Minister Klimkin agreed on the need to accelerate implementation of the Minsk agreements as the best way to bring peace to eastern Ukraine. The Secretary also urged continued progress on uh, reforms. Uh, Secretary met with the foreign ministers from the five states of the Central Asia, of Central Asia rather, uh, to discuss the status and future prospects for the uh, C5 plus one diplomatic platform. Uh, as well as uh, a broad range of regional challenges and opportunities, uh, including economic connectivity, security, environment, climate change, and humanitarian issues. Um, 
And then I think shortly, in fact, uh, I don't know if he's on schedule, but uh, right now uh, the Secretary is scheduled to meet with Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov. Uh, they expect uh, to discuss the uh, situation in Aleppo, including Russia's continued support uh, for the Syrian government's offensive on that city. Uh, the United States uh, remains very committed to a de-escalation of the violence there, as well as uh, finding uh, uh, unhindered uh, humanitarian access for the people of Aleppo. And then uh, finally, I, I think you saw earlier today that uh, Secretary Kerry will next travel on to Paris, France uh, from December 8th through the 11th uh, to participate in a ministerial meeting hosted by French uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs Jean-Marc Ayrault and co-organized by German and Qatari counterparts. Uh, the Secretary and his fellow ministers will uh, discuss the situation in Syria uh, in a separate ceremony, uh, Foreign Minister Ayrault will bestow France's Legion of Honor upon uh, Secretary Kerry. That's all I have. That's a lot, but over to you, Matt. Or er, Brad, I'm sorry. Just um, <laughs> on the Secretary's travel, do you expect the uh, Syria meeting in Paris to be a four-day meeting? Uh, I think it's three days, um, but uh, I, I think it's going to be Thursday and Friday is my understanding. I'm not sure what Saturday holds, but once we get a fuller schedule, we'll let you know. So the, me the meeting, you expect the meeting to start on, on Thursday? I'm not sure. Let me let me get more specifics. Why for I don't two have days? It. I apologize. Why for two days? It's always been for a couple hours. Again, I don't have the specifics of his schedule. I'm just saying he's going there to receive the Legion d'honneur, and he's also going to attend this meeting on Syria. Well, it's a lot of time for. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that thin I, I'm sure that his schedule will fill out accordingly. All right, uh, I don't have any substantive. Okay, uh, <laughs> just, uh, on the <laughs> just on the meeting. meeting with uh, with Lavrov, do you expect any any agreement, uh, uh, any uh, agreement on uh, the passage of the rebels from eastern Aleppo to to another area in uh, Syria? I mean, I don't. I mean, look, I'm not going to prejudge the outcome of a of a of a meeting that's just now taking place. Um, look, this is part of our ongoing efforts, uh, as you all well know, uh, to try to reach uh, some kind of uh, meeting of the minds with regard to uh, uh, at least a pause in the violence uh, in Aleppo uh, that can allow for humanitarian assistance uh, to reach uh, uh, the, the population there, uh, and also. Uh, more broadly, an effort to get the political uh, negotiations back on track. Um, we've talked about this in great detail. This is um, uh, uh, on top of the efforts that have really been intensifying over the last several days, uh, uh, including the Secretary's meeting with Lavrov last week in, uh, in Rome. Uh, so, you know, this is uh, ongoing. Are they speaking up, or is the Secretary Kerry trying to, um, are they, is he going there to speak about a ceasefire or, you know, the Russians repeated their um, their suggestion of, you know, getting the rebels out. Is that something that they're going to be specifically discussing? Is safe passage for all the rebels? If you can delve into that. Right. Uh, well, again, um, you know, without wanting to talk about or wanting to get into, rather, the details of uh, specifically the proposals that they're discussing, um, it is about trying to find uh, a, a way to, uh, uh, as I said, bring about a pause in the fighting. And we all know the elements uh, involved in that, uh, and certainly one of those is the opposition. Uh, and um, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, finding a way for them to uh, either uh, get passage out of Aleppo or to find some way to at least bring about an, a, a pause in the fighting uh, so that humanitarian assistance and medical assistance can get in uh, to Aleppo. Um, there are various uh, proposals being worked through, um, and I mean that uh, uh, sincerely, uh, that there's not, um, you know, there's ideas on the table that are being discussed on how to get there. Um, those are still being worked out, so I don't want to get ahead of that. No, no. Do we, we'll stay in Syria. No, yes, we'll Syria, Syria. Yeah, when, when you say yep. um, when you say a pause, well, uh, the, the Syrian army with with Russia's help has reportedly retaken around seventy percent. The last time I saw of eastern Aleppo, would you would you like them to uh, to stop? Would you like like them not to take the rest of the city? 
Well, again, I think what our and, – and you saw, uh, frankly, the, the statement uh, uh, that was released earlier today uh, by Canada, France, uh, the United States, clearly, Germany, Italy, and the United <coughs> Kingdom uh, that talked about uh, uh, the dire situation in Aleppo, um, the fact that it's being subjected to daily bombings and artillery attacks uh, uh, by the Syrian regime, supported by Russia. But uh, we're looking for an immediate – uh, cessation of, of uh, hostilities there, um, regardless of whether it's 70 percent taken, 75 percent taken, 80 percent taken by uh, the Syrian regime, we want to see uh, an end to the violence. You, you've been – this administration has been very vocal about um, civilian suffering throughout the operations uh, to retake eastern Aleppo. Other than civilians, what other concerns does the U.S. government have as the Syrian army, with Russia's help, are retaking eastern Aleppo, other than civilians? Well, uh, so first of all, just to also – just to uh, answer your first question, um, you know, the, the statement also said that, you know, they're looking for Russia and the Syrian regime uh, to comply with uh, the four-point UN plan. Uh, and that spells out in a very detailed way um, what we're looking for uh, uh, in terms of um, – resolving the situation, especially in Aleppo. It's a – first, a medical evacuation um, uh, of the sickest or most severely wounded uh, from eastern Aleppo. Um, we want to see an entry of medical supplies into Aleppo, access to medical supplies in order to treat those who can't be evacuated. Uh, we want to see an entry of food supplies into the city, um, since it's now been several months since uh, some parts of the city have had access to humanitarian convoys. Uh, and we want to see a, a rotation of doctors, uh, medical personnel um, who uh, are able to be rotated into the city to provide uh, medical care uh, for uh, many of those affected by the violence there. Um, your other question was about other your than civilians, yeah. what other concerns. Well, obviously, look, this is um, you know, we talked about this in great length the last couple of days, and I understand why. Um, but essentially, if there, there can be no uh, military resolution to the conflict in Syria, and um, even if uh, the Syrian regime is able, with Russia's help, to retake Aleppo, uh, that doesn't mean that the violence, the conflict, is going to end. And so what we need and, and what's at stake here is creating the conditions so that political negotiations can begin again in Geneva. And you're not going to – sure. We believe that it's only going to – so we believe, it, we believe that it's only going to exacerbate uh, the ongoing conflict, uh, that the opposition uh, is not going to lay down their arms, uh, but it's going to continue fighting. Uh, and in fact, uh, it can only uh, – as we fear and have expressed our concerns about, that it could, as I said, only uh, increase or escalate uh, the conflict, uh, not necessarily in Aleppo, but elsewhere in the, conf in the country. So if our ultimate goal here – sorry, if our ultimate goal here is just to get back to a political track here, uh, we don't believe uh, that the, the current trajectory is, is conducive to that. Do you think the retaking yeah, of Eastern – do you One think, more. though, uh, the retaking of Eastern Aleppo would be a defeat for al-Nusra? Uh, look, we're all about defeating al-Nusra. Um, uh, we agree on that. Uh, Russia and the United States are in agreement that Nusra is a terrorist organization and needs to be uh, dismantled and destroyed, much like Daesh does. Um, but uh, we have not seen uh, uh, that uh, Russia's focus has been on Nusra. It's been on uh, helping the regime uh, go after the moderate opposition in Aleppo. And, you know, that's uh, what we believe is taking place there. We were at a point – we had a deal on the table where we could have gotten to uh, 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 a place where we cooperated with Russia to take on Nusra. Uh, we're not there now, uh, but we both agree that Nusra is uh, a threat. So just to clarify, you, you don't you don't think that uh, yeah, it will defeat that. al Nusra? You just said. I'm sorry. That the, you said the opposition is not going to lay down its arm. That is not a call for the opposition no, not not to disarm. No, no, no. I'm just okay. – again, and this right. is – I don't yeah. want to – because yeah. sometimes – you're right – sometimes that can be misinterpreted that I'm somehow giving a call right. to arms. I am not doing that. Okay. I am just giving what our analysis is, and it's been consistent, is that there, the more you pursue a, a military solution, the more 
you risk exacerbating what is already uh, uh, a pretty darn complex uh, so point, conflict. You know, this the purpose of this letter, yeah. signed on by six leaders. What is the point uh, of the letter at this point? I mean, you know, is it to dissuade the Syrians from going pushing forward, or is it just to say, like, you know? Well, sure. We, we, I think it, it partly it was fueled by uh, what happened in the UN Security Council uh, two days ago, right. uh, where you know. Uh, uh, they did take up a resolution and it was vetoed, uh, I think, by China and by Russia. And you saw our explanation of vote uh, as a result of that or out, out, uh, coming out from that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, it's also uh, to lay down a marker to express the international community's, uh, you know, uh, growing uh, concern and outrage over uh, what's happening in Syria and to uh, speak out against what's happening there. So, you know, uh, Syrian television, whether you, you believe them or not, <coughs> or other, you know, satellite stations are showing thousands of people, maybe hundreds of people going to Western Aleppo, being greeted by the Syrian army, giving help and so on. Uh, in the event that they do, uh, you know, th th they sort of exercise their control over the whole city, uh, would you be willing, uh, as the United States, to, to aid in, in, in humanitarian aid into the delivery, although it is under Syrian control? Well, look, we've been providing, and we're the leader uh, in providing uh, humanitarian assistance right. to Syria. Um, if we can get access, if the UN, and the UN is primarily the, the, the provider of this humanitarian assistance, we obviously give them uh, a lot of money to do that, um, but they're, they're the ones who are most effective at it. They've got the infrastructure set up for that. If they can get access, <clears throat> excuse me, to regime-held areas of Syria and provide humanitarian assistance. Our focus is on getting humanitarian assistance to, to many of these areas that have been besieged for months and even years. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that regardless of who's in control. And uh, my, my final question is on, on the bombardment of uh, the Israeli bombardment of an air base uh, yeah. near, near Damascus. Uh, first of all, do you have any information on that? I don't. I, I, I'm aware of their reports. I'd have to refer you to the Israeli government. I just don't have any more details on it. I, I've do seen you feel reports. that such a, a bombardment could exacerbate a very bad situation? Uh, look, I mean, again, until I learn a little bit more about what happened, uh, you know, you've, we've obviously seen uh, Israel has uh, taken these kind of measures before uh, when they've been uh, threatened or uh, uh, received incoming fire from uh, parts of Syria. Uh, I just don't have any more details to offer at this yeah, point. An air base yeah. next to yeah, Damascus. Please. Brad, yeah. so in Syria? How do you know that the war is going to go on? Again, it's our assessment. I mean, I, you know, you, one could argue that the opposite. But, um, you know, it, it, there's, there's this perception out there that Aleppo is, you know, the, the coin of the realm or whatever the expression is, uh, and that if you take it that you somehow uh, you're going to have peace in the land. It's it's our assessment that that's not the case. Um, and Hasn't, yeah. having your assessments in Syria been you consistently wrong throughout this entire conflict? I mean, you guys, I mean, the secretary himself was among the people in Washington who thought Bashar Assad was a reformer. Uh, you thought his days were numbered after the conflict started. You didn't see the Russian intervention coming. You didn't see the growth of extremism in, in, in the ranks of the, of the rebels. You called, the president called the ISIS a JV team and didn't see that. I mean, you guys have been behind the curve on everything through five and a half years. And then what, well, and yet you're so sure of yourself on this. So, Brad, the, the counter argument to that is, um, first of all is, uh, and I can go point by point, but what you've seen is an evolution uh, of a conflict uh, that at every twist and turn has only been exacerbated when it could have been resolved by uh, Bashir al-Assad. And he has, you know, Secretary talked about this yesterday. He, you know, his reaction to peaceful protests only uh, made them more violent. Uh, the violence begat more violence. And then you had, uh, you know, Syrian opposition, <coughs> legitimate opposition, uh, then uh, taking up arms to defend itself against the Syrian regime's crackdown. He, uh, as much as he has complained about or has argued that he's only fighting terrorism, is the instigator of much of this terrorism that has uh, installed itself in Syria. 
And, you know, with respect to Dash, uh, you know, um, I would argue initial assessments aside, um, and I think you could argue that everyone underestimated uh, uh, Dash's uh, 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 strength uh, uh, at the start. But I think uh, a year and a half into our efforts to uh, defeat and destroy Dash, I think you can say that we've turned the tide against them. I'm not saying it's over by any means. But to get back to Syria, um, you know, I, I, all I can do is, is say our assessment is that um, you need a pause in the fighting. If you get a pause in the fighting, it can reach, it can become a credible ceasefire. If it can become a credible ceasefire, then you can have enough calm uh, uh, for the opposition to say, sure, we'll go to Geneva and talk again. I mean, this has always been, you know, again, it's a, it's a, it, it has always been contingent on uh, the parties involved in creating uh, the atmosphere or the environment needed for political negotiations. And time and time again, uh, and while I can't say the opposition hasn't been guilty in some cases of, uh, of violations of the cessation of hostilities, time and time again it's been the regime with Russia's help that has uh, created the conditions that have led to uh, these cessations of falling apart. And, and uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but the, the, while this conflict has escalated, especially in the last year or so, the situation on the ground has changed in that the regime and its backers have been on the offensive and they're regaining more and more territory. They're Which also is, limiting the conflict to smaller and smaller areas, mm -hmm. populated areas in the country. So in a sense, they, you know, at some point when there's no areas left that are contested, the war ends. Whether people are content or not, uh, that, that, that could be totally valid, that people don't like the situation. But if, if they eliminate the places where people uh, are fighting, then the war's over. And, you know, the result that you wanted didn't happen. Yeah, but it's, again, I mean, look, we can argue this all afternoon, but, uh, you know, it's, you're not, we don't believe that uh, current efforts to reach a military solution uh, are going to be successful uh, in Syria uh, for a lot of different factors. Um, and, uh, and again, just to go back to your previous question, um, you know, yeah, it's been a very complex and, and ever-changing uh, uh, situation in Syria, but, you know, we've tried to adapt uh, and uh, respond to that changing environment, and one of the ways we did so was to create this uh, group of stakeholders as a way to bring all sides, all parties, uh, to uh, the table so we could discuss a way forward. We did that. We found a way forward. But in executing that or implementing that, we've, we've been, been, been unsuccessful. Regarding Aleppo, do you, yeah, please. do you want to provide medical care to civilians only or to militant groups as well? Uh, well, I mean, to civilians uh, first and foremost, but uh, to any wounded. Yeah. And, and follow up, just uh, the House passed a bill uh, that gives the administration the right to send controversial weapons. It's, it's called Man Portable Air Defense Systems mm -hmm. to militant groups in Syria. So, what do you position on that? Do the House, support? the uh, the U.S. Congress, uh, yes, passed mm -hmm. a bill to send uh, manpads, giving the right to yeah. to the uh, to the administration to send uh, these weapons to militant groups in Syria. Well, I'm unaware that that legislation has passed. I mean, we've been very clear that we're not going to provide uh, um, uh, lethal assistance to uh, to the uh, opposition in Syria. So, do you? But that do doesn't you, do you to this. That doesn't, well, that doesn't mean that. I'll, and again, I'm not saying. <laughs> let me preface my remarks by saying I'm not encouraging this, but Secretary Kerry and others have said, you know, there are other uh, stakeholders uh, in Syria who are willing to uh, arm and continue to arm uh, members of the opposition. Do you oppose the, uh, this, like, transferring and sending uh, these kind of weapons to militant groups? Well, again, it's some, not something we pursued. We're, we're, we're seeking a political uh, solution uh, to the conflict in Syria. And I'm going to encourage different um, stakeholders as you told. Uh, Again, to... certainly those are part of the reasons why we still continue to talk to, on a multilateral setting, to uh, many of the stakeholders and part of the ISSG, the Sir International Syria Support Group, um, is to talk about those kinds of issues. 
every member of that group says they want a political solution, and that's their aim. But, uh, you know, as Secretary Kerry has also talked about before, there are spoilers. Uh, and I'm not talking about other stakeholders or other governments, but there are spoilers who are out there. Anytime there's a cessation of hostilities, anytime there's a, a political negotiations who are seeking to undermine those, that's the reality of the situation. Mark, on the issue of weapons, your government have refrained from supplying those kinds of weapons, lethal weapons, lest it fall in the wrong hands. I mean, that is the policy all along, man pads and stingers. Exactly, and so yeah. On. I mean, that's why, yeah, I thought yeah. I said that. So, yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, right. sorry. Mark, uh, sorry. Thanks. Thanks. said that the U.S. was in discussion with the Syrian opposition inside the, uh, Aleppo about leaving the city, and the uh, opposition has refused to leave. Can you confirm these reports? Um, well, uh, we have been in contact, as we've been throughout, uh, with uh, members or uh, uh, of the Syrian opposition, leaders in, in the Syrian opposition, moderate opposition, uh, and those contacts continue. Uh, I'm not going to try to uh, characterize their position, uh, which I think is also changing given uh, the, the situation that they're in. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, obviously, we're looking for any uh, credible effort, and I said this about the other day when there were uh, reports of talks between uh, taking place in Ankara between the Russians and opposition groups. We're in support of any effort that would, uh, any genuine effort that would uh, uh, ease the suffering uh, in Aleppo uh, and, uh, and, and uh, help bring humanitarian assistance to the population there. Um, we can remain in contact, talk, contact with the opposition uh, in Aleppo. Um, uh, but it, I'll leave it for them to speak about what their position is. And do you think that uh, do you think that the U.S. still have any leverage with the opposition in Syria? I, I mean, look. I mean, I think the Syrian opposition, moderate opposition, is assessing the situation, uh, which is indeed dire, uh, and uh, making their own decisions. Um, uh, you know, we have relationships with the opposition. I don't know if it's leverage per se, but it's we have relations with them, uh, and as such, uh, we will give them advice and counsel on what we believe they should do next. But you had leverage before. Well, again, this is, I mean, you know, these are ultimately uh, decisions of these groups, and this is, holds true with Russia and the regime. Uh, you know, any cessation of hostilities, any uh, de escalation of violence. Uh, does um, hinge on uh, uh, the ability for uh, those outside stakeholders to exert uh, influence or leverage, whatever you want to call it, on the, the actors on the ground. I have two, uh, two more questions. Sure, go ahead. Um, how do you feel that the U.S. is not invited to the meetings uh, between the uh, Russians and the Syrian opposition in Ankara? Uh, again, I, I think I answered that. We're, we're very much engaged with the Turks, uh, with the Russians, with the Saudis, with the Qataris, uh, with our European allies. Uh, uh, obviously, they're going to meet uh, in Paris uh, next couple of days. Um, uh, all, you know, there's talks, discussions going on at many different levels. Uh, let's put it that way. We're supported by the U.S. Well, again, we're, we're still in touch with these groups. And again, um, we're, we don't feel hurt because if, if, if there are genuine efforts uh, to resolve the fighting in Aleppo, we're supportive of those efforts. Right. And, you are advising these uh, militant groups. What, what's your advice right now for them? To get back to um, – and again, this is very difficult for them to do, and I've talked about this. It's very hard to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, these opposition groups agree to go back to the negotiating table in Geneva when they're under daily bombardment. Um, but if we can get a cessation, if we can get a pause, so there could be an opportunity to build some confidence uh, between the two uh, or the opposing sides, then we feel we can get a political uh, process back up uh, in, in Geneva. Um, but we got to get there. So. But are you asking and that's them to not, to, to not fight? I mean, given the fact that they're being attacked, are you asking No, of course, them and they're fight? defending themselves. I mean, obviously. I mean, that's – no. We're, we're not – but what we're trying to say is <laughs> we're trying to get – I mean, this is – you know, th this requires um, the buy-in of, of the moderate opposition. We understand Nusra is a different element altogether, um, but the moderate opposition has to buy into any de-escalation in violence, any pause in violence. They have to also agree not to fight. 
Um, but we're not there yet, and obviously when they're under daily bombardment, when they're under siege, it's hard to get there. How often is the U.S. in touch with them? I don't have a, a, a you know, I don't have a, a I mean, a um, fairly consistent, I don't know if it's daily, hourly. I, I have to Would look you say into like that. at least daily or? Uh, d depends, I think, but yeah, I'd say at least daily. Sorry, but you know, the opposition formed a new army. It's called the Army of Aleppo. Basically, they dissolved their separate names and they. Dis they I'm aware. You know, yeah. So that includes, you know, Nusra, Hashem, uh, Fatah Hashem, everybody, almost ISIS and so on. Well, so, again, it goes yeah, back to know, what. So, that, yeah. how are they so it goes back to what I. Sorry, go ahead. I don't mean to talk over you. No, no, go ahead. I, mean, I said it goes back to what I said before to Brad, which is, you know, when you. You know, you. When you. Uh, in the, and I'm talking about the Syrian regime here, when you create uh, uh, the conditions that you have today in Aleppo, uh, you know, you create and breed uh, the very type of extremism that you uh, claim to be defeating. Good. In the back, uh, in the back, we want to go to a different subject. Can we? Uh, I, I think we've exhausted Syria, I honestly. I have one more on, on Syria. Uh, after the statement that the six leader, leaders uh, have uh, issued today, uh, President Assad just announced that he decided to liberate the whole country. Any reaction to that? I, I don't, and I'm not going to respond to whatever uh, President Assad says. Different subject. Waste of my time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, let's go to, yeah. Okay, then, um, quick one on uh, the announcement today by the Trump transition team yeah. that Iowa Governor Branstad is... Uh, uh, being chosen as the ambassador to um, China. He's someone who has apparently known Xi Jinping for many, many years. In light of uh, other developments in recent days uh, on the U.S.-China relationship, uh, um, does the State Department uh, gauge this as a positive development? Um, so, uh Look, I mean, I, I guess I would have to say, you know, uh, this is uh, obviously something that the transition team would have to speak to. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I'd refer you to them. Um, you know, there's a, uh, they're obviously in the process of uh, looking at uh, their relations and, and uh, to some of the key uh, countries and governments around the world. Uh, and that's part of the transition process. Uh, but uh, as to, uh, uh, their intentions or as to uh, uh, their goals, I'd have to refer you to them. Iraq? Iraq? <coughs> Iraq Just yeah, one please. question. Uh, can I please read a news report yep. and uh, wonder if you can comment on this? Okay. Airstrikes on an Islamic State held town near Iraq's <laughs> western I'm sorry, border. you coughed and I dismissed it. Sure, I sure, sure. So um, the report says airstrikes on, on an ISIL held town near Iraq's western border with Syria killed dozens of people on Wednesday, including many women and children, two parliamentarians and local hospital sources said. They said the airstrikes hit a busy market in the town of Qaim in Iraq's Anbar province. Um, uh, Anbar lawmaker Ahmed al-Salmani and hospital sources said 55 civilians were were killed. Uh, can you comment on this? Uh, I cannot. It's the first time I'm hearing of it, so we'll look into it. Uh, is there any greater <clears throat> clarity on who was behind the airstrikes? Or? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll look into it. I just the first time I heard about it. Let's stay on Iraq, yeah. Yep. Special envo uh, Presidential Envoy Brett McGurk was recently in their bill. Can you give us a readout of his meetings there? I can, and I would, I'll preface this. I, I have a very short readout. Actually, not all that short, but um, uh, but we'll also put out a media note uh, giving even more detail. Um, but yes, he was, uh, you're talking about pre Special Presidential Envoy for the Global Coalition to Counter ISIL, Brett McGurk. Um, he's returning to Washington this afternoon, but he was in uh, Iraq uh, for eight days. Uh, he was in Baghdad, Erbil, uh, Suleimaniya, uh, uh, and Mosul, uh, at, at the Mosul front in Qazir in Iraq. He was also in Ankara, Turkey. And the focus of the visit was to uh, further accelerate uh, the campaign against Daesh uh, with emphasis on ensuring uh, the stability or the re restoration of stability in some of the liberated areas in uh, in Iraq, uh, and in Baghdad he met with um, President uh, Masum. Uh, he went met with uh, Prime Minister uh, Al Abadi. Uh, he met with uh, the Speaker, as well as other senior political and security officials. And in Erbil and uh, Sulaimaniyah, uh, Brett met with um, President 
IKR President uh, uh, Barzani. He met with uh, Prime Minister Barzani as well, Vice President Russell, uh, as well as uh, uh, PUK uh, Politburo member uh, Hiro Talabani. Uh, he also traveled to the eastern axis of the Mosul Offensive uh, to meet with members of the Kurdish Peshmerga, uh, as well as the Iraqi Army, and review their progress in the advance toward Mosul. Uh, also, while in the north, he met with the governor of uh, Nineveh province, uh, Nafal Agub, to review stabilization and humanitarian programs uh, for liberated neighborhoods. And then uh, he also, of course, uh, as I mentioned, traveled to Ankara uh, for meetings with senior officials in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and the Presidential Palace. So as I said, we'll put out even a more detailed readout uh, in probably a few minutes Would after you, the briefing. Thank you. Look forward to that. Would you know if he was satisfied with the progress that's being made in Mosul? Because there's some reports that sure. the Army is uh, moving uh, Again, I'll, I'll leave it for the readout. Uh, of course, uh, you know, satisfy, satisfied is a, is a relative term. I think, uh, obviously, we'll only be satisfied when uh, uh, Mosul is completely liberated uh, and uh, we're able to get in and help stabilize it. Uh, but uh, I think we're, uh, we believe that progress, slow and steady progress, is taking place. Uh, we said from the very start of this operation, this Iraqi-led operation, that this was going to be a long uh, struggle. Uh, this is uh, one of uh, Daesh's uh, strongholds and they were, they were going to fight to retain it, uh, and uh, that's been the case. Uh, we have made slow and steady progress. Iraqi forces have made slow and steady progress, uh, but we're not there yet. And I have a question on Turkey, if there's no more Iraq question. Uh, sure. Um, Amnesty International just published a report on Turkey's forced dislocation of some half million people in the Kurdish regions of the country and suggested there was, in fact, a premeditated plan of population transfer. What is your comment on that in the report generally? Uh, we've seen this report uh, from Amnesty International. Uh, we've expressed our grave concern regarding the violence in southeast Turkey, uh, and uh, we would urge uh, the PKK uh, to lay down its arms uh, so that Turks forced from their homes to flee the violence uh, can safely return home. Uh, we've said repeatedly we stand by uh, Turkey in the fight against terror. Uh, in all of its forms, and that includes against the PKK. Uh, and as Turkey's friend and ally, uh, we urge the government of Turkey to ensure the, that the rule of law and fundamental rights and freedoms are protected. You, so you dispute Amnesty's suggestion that there's a, a plan of forced dislocation? You don't think that's going on? Uh, what I said was uh, that um, this is uh, that many of the uh, Turks forced to flee their homes uh, have done so as a result of uh, PKK uh, violence. Please, let's go to Mike, and, and I'll get to you. On, on Turkey, Mark, did you see these reports that the uh, son-in-law of uh, President Erdogan has ties with uh, ISIS operations, smuggling oil into Turkey? Yeah, I mean, look, we've, uh, you know, first of all, WikiLeaks, we don't touch WikiLeaks. Uh, we don't touch it. No, but aside from aside that, from we, these are allegations we've heard before. Um, yeah. We've been very strenuous in saying that while we cannot rule out any uh, illegal smuggling of uh, of oil, uh, or ISIL, uh, um, uh, ISIL refined or ISIL uh, oil, ISIL owned oil uh, across the border from Turkey because uh, those routes, smuggling routes, have been in existence, as we've said before, for centuries. Um, Turkey has uh, taken steps to uh, seal up, close off uh, its border uh, with uh, Syria, uh, and uh, that's had an effect on this trade. Uh, but we've seen nothing uh, to lead us to believe that there's any kind of uh, government involvement in this trade. I, I have some questions on Cyprus, if they finish with uh, Let's go Middle East, and then we'll come back okay. to you for Cyprus. Go ahead. Very quickly, uh, President Hollande invited uh, both Abbas and Netanyahu to meet in Paris uh, on, the side, uh, on the side of the uh, conference on the 21st of December. Do you have any comment on that? Do you have uh, I don't. Uh, um, any position? Will the United States attend? Something? Well, we, we haven't made any final decision on whether we'll attend or not. Um, you know, um, and our understanding at this point is that uh, a final date hasn't been set. Um, so it's partly once that date has been set, we'll look at the secretary's schedule uh, to see, and that, of course, will be factored into our decision. Um, uh, we are also waiting to hear more from the French about uh, the agenda and what they believe can be achieved. Uh, through this conference, uh, but of course we maintain an open mind uh, with respect to uh, uh, 
any effort to uh, bring about uh, or uh, create the conditions where uh, uh, the parties can come back to the negotiating table. Uh, and we want to ensure that we do whatever is constructive. Uh, so we're waiting to hear more details. Let me ask you about the, I, I don't know if you're aware, there is a village right next to Ramallah, the Adair Nadam, that has been besieged and turned into a prison ever since the fires broke out. Although the uh, the, the local police and the local uh, authorities are saying there is nothing to suggest that it was arson. But the Israeli yeah. army has besieged it, we're, deprived people yeah. from leaving and so on. Yeah. We're aware of the reports. Um, you know, we've said this many times, you know, uh, while we understand uh, that Israel needs to uh, protect its citizens and take measures to do so. Um, we expect that any measures Israel takes uh, minimizes the impact on Palestinian civilians going about their daily mm -hmm. lives. But the fire that, you know, basically put this village under siege is basically uh, broke out in a settlement on, you know, an illegal settlement yeah. on Palestinian uh, yeah. land. No, we're, we're again, saying. we're aware of all the reports surrounding this. And again, you know, uh, our, uh, Emphasis is on when when Israel does take these kinds of measures that they do so uh, in a way that's respectful that people need to live their daily lives in the back, please. Uh, the special Pakistani rep uh, to Prime Minister Tariq Fatmi is in the town yep. and he met uh, Tony Blinken, the Under Secretary of State, a couple of days ago. So, yep. do you have any readout or uh, what was the topic of the discussion? Well, uh, he did meet, as you noted, with special advisor to the Prime Minister in Foreign Affairs, uh, Tariq Fatima, Fatimi, excuse me. Uh, on December 5th, and they discussed a range of bilateral and regional uh, issues, um, including regional stability and counterterrorism cooperation. So in Heart of Asia Conference in India, the Prime Minister Modi and uh, Afghan Premier Ashraf Ghani lash out at Pakistan on terrorism. Even Mr. Ghani suggests that uh, suggest Pakistan to spend $500 million to curb terrorism rather than giving aid to Afghanistan. So it clearly indicates the tensions and mistrust uh, between the regional partners. How much it concerns you? Well, look, uh, we've seen uh, President Ghani's remarks uh, at the Heart of Asia conference. Uh, I'd refer you to the government of uh, Afghanistan uh, regarding those remarks. Um, for our part, we have consistently expressed our concerns uh, to the highest level uh, levels of the government of Pakistan about uh, their continued tolerance uh, for Afghan Taliban groups, uh, such as the Haqqani Network, uh, operating from Pakistan soil. And we continue to encourage the government of Pakistan to, uh, uh, and, the, and Afghanistan rather, uh, both governments to cooperate in their counterterrorism operations and efforts because that's only going to contribute to regional stability. Sir, uh, I was hoping that you were going to talk about the plane crash in Pakistan in today's morning. I, I will. I apologize. People. Yeah, no. Um, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Um, obviously, we've uh, been following reports of that. Uh, uh, crash of a Pakistan International Airlines flight, uh, which was, I believe, a domestic flight en route from Shitral to uh, Islamabad. Um, uh, obviously, our condolences uh, to the victims of that plane crash. Uh, uh, we uh, have offered uh, assistance, uh, any assistance we can offer uh, to the Pakistani government, uh, and our embassy in Islamabad is in contact with the government, uh, again, uh, to see if we can help with uh, rescue or recovery operations. Thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate it. A Palestinian delegation is uh, going to travel to the United States next week uh, for meetings with State Department officials and may meet uh, with the Trump transition team. Uh, this the newspaper says it has learned this information. Um, do you have anything on this? No, nothing okay. to confirm at this point. So I'll Can let you, you know get if back that changes. Tomorrow? Yeah. Well, okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll get to you. You had a question. Well, we're still in. What are we on? It's a totally separate. They're both separate, so. Okay. You're first. Thank you very much. You're a gentleman. Um, <laughs> Secretary Kerry of late has seemed more optimistic about the future of the Paris Agreement under the next administration. Um, I was wondering if that assessment had changed at all with today's appointment of Oklahoma Attorney General Scott Pruitt as the head of the EPA, who has been fairly open about his opposition to Obama's climate change policies. Uh, I think the Secretary Kerry has been very measured uh, in his uh, uh, assessment of what the next administration may or may not do uh, with regard to uh, the climate agreement. I think where he has been very um, uh, vocal is that the 
international community, the global community, is going to keep moving forward with climate change. And you've seen this uh, expressed from governments uh, throughout the world and across the range of, you know, uh, developed countries to developing countries that they're not going to back out of or walk away from uh, the Paris Agreement. And so that gives us confidence that as this new administration uh, uh, transitions into power, uh, that they'll also see the merits uh, of the direction in which we're moving. The world is moving. And, you know, Secretary Kerry's also been clear that it's, it's only partly about uh, a change in public policy. Uh, it's mostly about the signal that that change sends to uh, the private sector and, uh, and civil society. And that change has already taken place, and that switch has already turned, uh, where you have companies coming in and saying they want to see uh, the Paris Agreement uh, remain in place because they're already moving away from fossil fuels into new uh, types of uh, um, eco-friendly uh, energy sources. And so, in a way, that shift's already taken place. That train's left the station. But again, I don't want to speak on behalf of the incoming administration. Uh, what I will say is that we believe uh, that it's in uh, the United States' interest to move forward. I have one more along Please, those lines. Has there been any change in the status um, as to whether or not the President-elect has received briefings from the State Department regarding uh, To my understanding, he has not yet. And that's that, so no change. Uh, yes, sorry. Um, according to the Turkish press, uh, the Secretary met uh, yesterday with the Foreign Minister of Turkey. Uh, I wanted to know if you have any readout. Also, I saw pictures in the Turkish press that Mrs. Nuland met with uh, Turkish Cypriot leader. If you have any readout uh, about this. So he and did, if he's going to meet with a Greek foreign minister. Sure. He did meet uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, with the Turkish foreign minister. Uh, we were trying to get a readout uh, uh, before this meeting, before this meeting, before this briefing, <laughs> excuse me, uh, and uh, have not. Um, you know, you, I can imagine primarily it was focused on Syria, uh, efforts to uh, defeat Daesh. Uh, but as to the other parts of that meeting, uh, uh, wait and see. We'll, we'll, when we get more information about it, we'll certainly share. No, they say that they talk about uh, Cyprus and how the United States. I can't States... rule it out. I just don't know. I just yeah. haven't been able to confirm but, that. But uh, did the secretary start any effort on Cyprus? Well, I mean, uh, look, we're always supportive of the UN process uh, to resolve uh, the situation on Cyprus, and it's always a topic, uh, or frequently a topic, when we meet with uh, uh, Turkish government officials or. Uh, obviously, Cypriot government officials. Uh, with regards to whether he's going to meet so with the Greek uh, foreign minister, I can't confirm that. Okay, can you check for Yeah, um, I can. Thank you very Thanks. much. Yeah. Is that it, guys? Thanks.